All right. We are about to continue uh, this critically important study in the doctrine of glorification. And I hope that you understand my heart in all of this and why I am spending time to really go in to some detail for this doctrine, uh, because so much of your future uh, greatness of your satisfaction in eternity, in the kingdom to come, uh, depends on these things that we have been studying. And we're looking at not only what happens to us as the Gentiles, but also with the Jewish believers and what we've been studying in Daniel chapter 12 and then in Ezekiel uh, 24 and other passages, uh, or Ezekiel 20, excuse me, and 34 and other passages about the importance of this reward. My heart's desire more than anything is to see you approved. Um, I, I, I Sometimes I sit and just can't hardly hold the tears back, uh, thinking about you individually, bringing your little faces to mind, praying for you. Uh, if all of this doesn't help us motivate to being disciples, then I don't know what does. So it's difficult. You know, it's one thing for people to understand the message of life. It's quite something else for them to become disciples. Discipleship takes time and effort and consistency. Uh, and it's, it's not easy. Uh, that's, that's the hard part. You know, as they say, uh, eternal, the eternal life is free, but rewards are costly. You want to be rewarded. The, your Savior is going to stand before you face to face, one on one. And there's nothing more you want to hear than well done, good and faithful servant. I can hardly imagine what a terrible thing it would be to stand before him and with tears running down his face, hear him say, depart from me. Not to hell, because he guaranteed you that life, but into a lesser quality of life and even the outer darkness. Uh, so we're going to study some of these things today. And remember that this is training time for raining time. Uh, and you know, when you get home and the Lord says, well done, good and faithful servant you're reigning over X number of cities, or this is your job, this is what I'm giving you to do. Just also understand that where something may begin in the coming kingdom doesn't mean it's just gonna stay there because the kingdom is gonna to continue to expand throughout eternity after the thousand years is over. The thousand years is simply just a simple little gateway. It's the closing of human history. Uh, but then all of these things, since rewards are eternal, will go on into uh, forever, <laughs> forever. Uh, and, you know, we, we all get so time focused that we, we lose sight of the truly important things in life. So just real quick, let's, let me just sort of get us back on the page again where we need to be. Romans 8, 17. Just go ahead and turn over to it real quick. Romans chapter 8. Verse 17. Where Paul writes, for I consider that the sufferings of this present time. Now, sufferings doesn't always mean somebody's beating you up or hitting you with bricks or, or whatever. The sufferings has to do with your public identification with the Lord Jesus Christ. Even if others reject you, uh, even if others don't like you. Uh, and it may go to persecution. Uh, it may go to all kinds of things of sacrifices you have to make. Uh, one of the, one of the, most difficult things to do, I believe, is the sacrifice of discipleship, to realize that, that learning the word of God can be just an academic study. But if you're just learning <clears throat> academics without walking in fellowship with the spirit of God so that it can become a living reality within your life, then you're not going to advance. Right. Right. 
Uh, it takes the, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, walking by the means of the Holy Spirit to get these things down. So that's all part of that suffering. That's that commitment, that focus that needs to be made. And can I just suggest to you that focusing while I'm teaching could also be suffering. Now, he says, I consider the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that is to be revealed in us. Let me back up to, to 17. And if children, heirs also, heirs of God, every believer has that. And fellow heirs with Christ, the fellow heir with Christ is conditional. If indeed we suffer with him, if, and we'll assume that he's, he's writing, he says that if, and we're going to assume it's true about you, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it is true. If we suffer with him, then so that we may also be glorified with him. And that's that glorification aspect that we have been studying in this uh, process of the doctrine of glorification. And that's why he says, I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that is to be revealed in us. The little word there is ace, E-I-S, uh, English transliteration of it. And it could be a variety of things, but this is in us. That's the glory uh, that we are talking about with your glorified body. And Hebrews 2.10, you don't need to turn there. The Lord's, the, the purpose of the Lord Jesus Christ with everything he did in time ultimately was to lead many sons to glory. Sons doesn't mean males, but it means all believers, all believers. He wants to lead you to that glory aspect of sharing that reign with him, sharing in that glorification with him. So remember, Jesus had both his essential glory as God, his acquired glory as a man. As in his acquired glory as a man, he set the pace for us. The, the aspects of his glory that he achieved in his manhood are paralleled with the same three that we can have when we allow him to do his work in our lives. That is what he wants to share with us is that sharing of his glory. All three of them fit into this glorification here. And remember, there were the three aspects of his glorification. One was that glorified physical body that came with the resurrection. It was more than just a resurrected body, but it was a glorified body, a body with all of the power and all of the everything that the glorified body has, including the shining that is seen and other places in the scripture, that resurrection body. Then he went home to heaven with the ascension. In his present glory, he is glorified with honor as a man on the Father's throne. And then thirdly, he's going to be glorified in the kingdom as the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Now, all three of those aspects we can share with him. And our resurrection, every believer is going to be resurrected. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. That's a guarantee when you believe you'll be resurrected. And we have pointed out, and we'll see it again today, I, we get there, that we'll have, every believer has immortal and incorruptible bodies, but not every believer has a glorified body. We can share in his glorification if we qualify for it. We are also going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ and have our evaluation. And we will be honored as kings and priests, or, uh, as kings and queens or not. And those kings and queens also are priestly servants of the Lord Jesus Christ. We're part of a priestly, kingly kingdom. That's part of our service. And our, we will be crowned in that, our coronation, if it is earned. So that is, all of ours are in the future, but we can have exactly parallel to him. Now, we've been studying in the, uh, the, the in Bible prophecy. We have looked at all of those things leading up to that 75-day period that comes at the end, between the end of the second coming and the start of the millennial kingdom. The millennial kingdom is where Christ reigns for a thousand years. One of those things we've been looking at in that 75-day period, we saw the, the judgment of the sheep and goats, which is the Gentile nations. We've studied all of those things. Uh, <clears throat> but then we've also been looking at the Jewish Bema, and we're going to continue that because there's lessons out of what happens in that for us in today's world. 
Go with me then over to Daniel chapter 12. Daniel chapter 12. Let's just read the first three verses. Of course, we have been over this several times, so we're just going to highlight a couple of things. And then we're going to expand a little bit on verse 3. So the prophet Daniel is looking at the end of time. So the time frame, if you were to see it on that chart that I just had up there, uh, is the end of the tribulation period is the time of the second coming. And at the very end of the tribulation period, there will be that intense attack by the Antichrist, by the demonic armies, by the world's uh, armies under the Antichrist against the nation of Israel. Uh, and especially against the leadership that will be down in what is, we call it Petra, Basra, Southern Lebanon in today's world. Um, and there eventually, uh, before all of the attack comes in and kills every living Jew, the leadership reverses what happened in the first century. They not only recognize Jesus as the Messiah, but call on him to return. So what we see in Daniel 12, 1 is that moment in time where it says, now at that time, Michael, the great prince who stands guard over your people, he's the archangel who is the national guardian of the nation of Israel. He will arise up uh, or he will arise. It means he's going to stand up. He's going to take a defensive stand and there will be a time of distress or trouble such as never occurred since there was a nation until that time. That's the tail end of the tribulation period. It would, you could say it was the last three and a half years, but this is especially intense right at the tail end of it. And at that time, that same time, right at the tail end of it, your people, that's the Jewish people, Daniel was Jewish, everyone who is found written in the book will be rescued or delivered, the New King James says. The, those who are written in the book, it, that's the book of life, those who have eternal life. At the moment of faith alone, in Christ alone, your name is written in the book of life, and there are no, there are no erasers for that book. <laughs> and then he goes on. So those are the rescued. Now, verse 2, many of those who sleep in the dust of the ground, sleep is always a reference to about believers. Um, they are also written in the book, uh, will awake. That's the resurrection of believers. Now, this, the focus here is Jewish believers, but we have identified this is probably also the exact same time that all of the Old Testament believers and I would say tribulational believers will be uh, resurrected for those who have died. These to everlasting life, but others to disgrace and everlasting contempt. Those are also believers. So everyone who is alive at that time frame will be rescued. Everyone of the Old Testament believers, including the Jews, um, are resurrected at that time frame. Now, it doesn't say that all are resurrected. Unbelievers are not resurrected until the end of the millennial kingdom to stand before the great white throne. So this is believers only resurrection. Now, remember the church, before all of this has happened, the church has already gone home. We will go home before the tribulation period. We will be either by, by resurrection or rapture. It's a very similar, exact same thing. These are rescued, so we'll be rescued or raptured out. And those who have already died in the Lord, died in Christ, will be resurrected. That's at the rapture of the church. We're going to go home. We're going to have our evaluation at the Bema Seat of Christ. And the, sometime after that, uh, the tribulation period on earth starts. Now fast forward to the end of the tribulation and you have this time of the resurrection of the Old Testament saints along with the Jewish Old Testament saints and tribulational saints. Jewish people who are part of the church age which happened from the day of Pentecost until the day of the rapture have already been resurrected. There's no distinction between Jew or Gentile uh, when it comes down to the church as far as uh, we're being one in the body of Christ. So they've already been resurrected. So this is all the Old Testament believers and, uh, like I said, the, the, I believe, tribulational believers. Now, so some of those are going to awake. These to everlasting life. That's a quality of life. 
uh, not everlasting, not, not the, they're not suddenly given the gift of eternal life. This is the quality of life. It's a positive experience that they're going to have during the millennial kingdom and on into eternity. But others, believers, to disgrace and everlasting contempt. How long is the disgrace and contempt? Everlasting. How about those who are awakened to that quality of life? How long is it? Everlasting. Rewards are eternal. So is loss of rewards. Now, verse 3. Those who have insight will shine brightly like the brightest of the expanse of heaven. And those who lead many, lead the many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. And that's the glorification aspect. And that's, we're going to be looking at some of that over the next little bit here today. And probably, I'm sure, next time also. So this is the event of the 75-day period. Logically, this, this, this event happens before the, the judgment of the, of the Gentile nations. That is before the sheep and the goats, which we've studied. This should be the first event. And we have seen over in Ezekiel chapter 20. Ezekiel chapter 20. Verses 33 to 38. Ezekiel 20, 33 to 38. You sure and turn in your Bibles so you see it in front of you. As I live, declares the Lord, surely with a mighty hand and with an outstretched arm and with wrath poured out, I shall be king over you. That certainly refers to the, to, the, uh, to the tribulation period. It's the process that he has gone through. And then he says, I will bring you out from the peoples. And you find this parallel to Matthew 24, 31, where the Lord Jesus Christ is going to send out his angels and every living Jew is going to be collected from wherever they are on the face of the planet. And at the same time frame, we, we see in Matthew 24 that uh, in a couple other passages that they're going to be gathered from everywhere, from the furthest part of heaven. That's referring to the, to the resurrection. It's the same resurrection that we see here in Daniel. So, and I will gather you from the peoples and gather you from the lands where you were scattered with a mighty hand, with an outstretched arm, and with wrath poured out, or having been under wrath. Notice that these, he says, I will bring you into the wilderness of the peoples. We looked at that. They're outside the land of Israel for the judgment. It seems to me that that, that wilderness, the same wilderness with that during the time of the Exodus, uh, where they were in the wilderness of Sinai. It also seems logical to me that they will be back at what's called Kadesh Barnea. If you don't know what I'm talking about, don't worry about it. You'll get this down as you go. Um, the Kadesh Barnea during the time of the Exodus is where the Jewish people rebelled against the Lord. They were fearful. They didn't go in to conquer the land. They were outside the land. It was at that moment that the Lord said, all of those from 20 years up and older will never enter the land. So you have a similar parallel there. And, and if you go back, you can look in, the, in, the, in Ezekiel 20, and you'll see him talking about what happened in the Exodus event. What, we're, what you're seeing is that the Lord says he's going to bring them. I will enter into judgment with you, verse 35, face to face. They're going to see the Messiah. They are all believers. If they're not believers, they're not even there. They're, they're all believers. And then he says, I will, as I is going to enter into judgment in the wilderness, as I entered into judgment with your fathers in the wilderness of the land of Egypt, so I will enter into judgment with you, declares the Lord. I will make you pass under the rod and bring you into the bond of the covenant. The passing of the rod was the idea of not only counting those that were his, his flock, but also they would use the rod to move the fur back and forth to inspect. And so it refers to the idea of the face-to-face -face judgment. And notice in 38, I will purge from you the rebels and those who transgress against me. I will bring them out of the land where they, land where they sojourned. In other words, they were, wherever they were scattered around the world. I will bring them out of that land, but they will not enter the land of Israel. We saw this last time, remember? They will be there, they will be, I believe they will be there and they will be able to see the land, the land of promise, the covenant promise, the Abrahamic promised land, but they will not be allowed to enter it. This speaking of the Jewish people. They will not enter the land of Israel. Thus, they will know that I am the Lord. Now, 
As I live, declares the Lord God, verse 33, that word Lord is Adonai, our master, where God means Yahweh, our creator, redeemer. He's making a serious declaration to them. He's identifying himself. This is the Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ, who is doing this face-to-face -face measurement, and he identifies himself immediately as the Lord God. He is the master. He is Adonai. He is Yahweh. He is the creator and the redeemer. He's the one making the declaration. It's for emphasis to realize the seriousness of this face-to-face -face confrontation. So there, first, they report, he reports a negative evaluation. Those born-again Jews who will live in the kingdom, but outside the land of Israel. The land of Israel would be their ancestral kingdom. And I'll, have, I'll show you a chart on this if I, if I can get there. Uh, includes people of both groups. The rescued, that is those in their physical bodies, and the resurrected, those who have been brought back to life. They will be, of those two separate groups, there will be those who will not be allowed to live in the land of Israel. But then there's the positive evaluation. Look down at 44, then you will know, uh, well, that doesn't work, 44 to 42, that's backwards. Uh, verse 42, and you will know that I am the Lord when I bring you into the land of Israel, into the land which I swore to give to your forefathers. The you has to be those that he is now bringing into the land, not those that he kept outside of the land. There you will remember your ways and all your deeds with which you have defiled yourselves. You will loathe yourselves in your own sight for all the evil things that you have done. Then you will know that I am the Lord. Stop for a minute. These are the people that he's given a positive evaluation to and he is bringing into the land and yet they remember all of the things that they did, not only nationally, but individually. Many of these people, beloved, are living Jews today, if the rapture is as close as I think it is, who are rejecting the Messiah. They're going to be very upset with themselves that they rejected God's grace for so long and they had to go through the tribulation period. Also, there will be many of those that will continue to reject the Lord. There will be those who are the rebels and the transgressors who, even though they're believers, are not submitting to the authority of God for their own purposes. But yet, out of that group of people, are, are all of those folks, not necessarily the rebels and the transgressors, I'll show you that in a second, but these people, even though they messed up, what has he done? extended grace he's extended grace somewhere along the line they had repented somewhere along the line they straightened their life out you know and beloved listen i love our god of fresh starts Amen. and that's what is to me is perfectly clear there the god of fresh starts i don't know about you but i had to have more than one fresh start in my life <laughs> and every day when we walk with the lord he offers us a new day it's not New Day USA, it's, it's New Day Adonai. Huh? How about that one? But anyhow, uh, you have an opportunity to restart. And that's grace. What do you do with your past? Forget it. That's what you do with your past. You forget it. Because it's under the blood, it's gone. You're forgiven. Let it go. Amen. When Satan comes along and wants to beat you up to remind you of all your failures of your past, you simply remind him of his future and go on about your business. You know, whistle while you pray. Well, I don't know about that one, but anyhow. So he says, uh, then you will know that I am the Lord when I have dealt with you for my name's sake, not according to your evil ways or according to your corrupt deeds, O house of Israel. But if that doesn't spell G-R-A-C-E, I don't know what that. That's how wonderful grace is. That's what I, one problem I have with legalists that are in today's world that says, well, you know, if you don't really behave yourself, you're going to lose your salvation. Go on and insult God one more time. And if you're a believer, see what the Father has to say about that when you show up. Well, anyway. Ezekiel 34, here's another expression of what's going to happen in a positive reward. Look at this, Ezekiel 34, picking up at 23. Ezekiel 34. 
we looked at the evaluation and the upper part of this where he talked about, I'm gonna judge between sheep and sheep, between the fat sheep and the strong sheep versus, versus the, the, those who are broken and all these other things. Now look at what he says, beginning at 23. Then, that is after the judgment, then comes the kingdom. Then I will set over them one shepherd, my servant David, and he will feed them. Who's his servant David? That's King David. King David, resurrected, serving under the Messiah, over the nation of Israel. Now, by the way, is he physically alive or resurrected? Oh, come on. Is, he, is King David still alive, walking around somewhere? I'm not King David, okay? This, he's got to be one of the resurrected ones. Jeez. It's, yeah, everybody sometimes afraid to answer a question. Like, is he trying to give me a quick question? Yeah, well, it could be, because I do that sometimes. So that means he's going to be in a glorified state. He's one of those shining ones. And he will feed them himself and be their shepherd. And I, the Lord, will be their God. That's the Lord Jesus Christ, the Messiah. My servant David will be prince among them. I, the Lord, have spoken. And I will make a covenant of peace with them and eliminate harmful beasts from the land. That covenant of peace is the new covenant. Uh, Jeremiah 31. Uh, harmful beasts from the land so they may live securely in the wilderness and sleep in the woods. That should make Bruce happy. I will make them and the places around my hill a blessing. Now, his hill is going to be, of course, the new temple mount, the mountain that's going to be raised up. But may I suggest to you, it also is a double reference to the new Jerusalem. And we're going to be talking about that here in the near future. And now look at this. We sing the song, Showers of Blessing. This is where it comes from. I will call showers to come down on their season and, there, and they will be showers of blessing. Also, the tree of the field will yield its fruit and the earth will yield its increase and they will be secure in their land. Then they will know that I am the Lord when I have broken the bars of their yoke and delivered them from the hand of those who enslaved them. They will no longer be a prey to the nations. The beasts of the earth will not devour them, but they will live securely and no one will make them afraid. I will establish for them a renowned planting place and they will not again be victims of famine in the land. They will not endure the insults of the nations anymore. Anti-Semitism is on the increase everywhere in the world right now. So much so that even unbelievers are paying attention to it. All over Europe is becoming strongly anti-Semitic. But anyway, then they will know that I, the Lord their God, am with them. And that they, the house of Israel, are my people, declares the Lord. As for you, my sheep, the sheep of my pasture, you are men and I am your God declares the Lord God. Go back to Daniel 12, 3. Now follow along here. You still with me? Focus. Now, <clears throat> Daniel 12, 3. Those who have insight will shine brightly like the brightness of the expanse of heaven and those who lead many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. There will be those born again Jews who are going to live in the heavenly aspect of the kingdom in their glorified bodies. Now hear me, because this is the, the, the this is something we're going to have to be inspecting. And that is the heavenly aspect of the kingdom. If you, you can keep your finger there in Daniel if you want to, but go with me over to Hebrews and just take a look at something. Because if they have glorified bodies, where are they going to live? What's their home base? The New Jerusalem. The New Jerusalem. And look at this. The Old Testament saints knew this. Now, many people say, Jewish tradition says, that people in the Old Testament actually saw the New Jerusalem. And it may be the New Jerusalem was actually over the earth during the time prior to the flood. But certainly, they seemed to, they knew it was there. Hebrews chapter 11, verses 9 and 10. By faith, we're talking about Abraham now. He lived as an alien in the land of promise. What is the land of promise? That's Israel. As in a foreign land, dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, fellow heirs of the same promise. Now look at what the verse 
10 says, why did he live in the promised land like he was an alien? For he was looking for a city which has foundations whose architect and builder is God. What on earth is that? That's the new Jerusalem. That's the home of the overcomers. That's your home, beloved, for all of eternity. If you receive the overcomer status. Drop down to uh, verse 13, talking about others beside Abraham. All these died in faith without receiving the promises, but having seen them and welcomed them from a distance, what are they seeing? It's the promises, but let's go on. Having confessed they were strangers and exiles on the earth, for those who say such things make it clear that they're seeking a country of their own. So in 9 and 10, it's a city. Here, it's a country. What is that? That's all of the new Jerusalem. That's the heavenly country. That's the heavenly aspect of the kingdom. That's their true home, their real home. It is your real home as an overcomer. So all the way back to the very first Jew, Abraham, he had seen that city who, that was built by God, the city which has foundations, the idea of foundations, a city that can never be overthrown, a city that will never decay. That is the eternal city. It's in glory now. Some people will argue if you could see into another dimension, it's right here. I don't know that. But certainly when you pass out of this life and go home, you're either going to see it or live in it. And if everyone is living in it, that means that at the time of the judgment, when it comes down to the millennial kingdom, those who are not the overcomers have to move. You could argue it either direction. I'm not going to take a stand either way. But be that as it may, it's a literal and real city. Now go back. They're going to shine brightly like the expanse of heavens. These are the ones that are going to be in that heavenly aspect of the kingdom. So you see why I say this. Those rescued who are approved to rule will be changed into glorified bodies. Along with the overcoming resurrected. They're going to live in that city. That's what's amazing. Remember when we were doing the study of the sheep and the goats. The Lord said to those who were positive toward the Jews. They were the white sheep, if you will, the overcomers. He said, you're, you're, going, to the, you're going to inherit the kingdom. That inheritance requires them to have resurrected, glorified bodies. We'll see this in 1 Corinthians 15. But it says, listen to me. It says, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom. Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom. They cannot be rulers in flesh and blood. That has to mean they have glorified bodies. They're going to live in the new Jerusalem, the heavenly aspect of the kingdom. Go with me to Colossians real quick, 1.13. Are you all still with me? All right. You can ask Miss Crystal. For days, weeks, I have been walking around pulling my hair up. Reading, studying, trying to put all this down in a teachable format. And then I get so excited about it, I couldn't hardly stop. I'd wake up early in the morning with this on my mind. And then try and figure out, now, okay, there's a lot that I can't say because I would be on this topic for a year. So what do I say? <laughs> Colossians 1.13. I heard that over there. Listen. Let's talk about the kingdom. For he rescued us, that is God the Father, rescued us from the domain of darkness. The domain of darkness is this world. The domain of darkness is the, is the kingdom of Satan. Remember, Satan is the ruler of this world. You were born in the kingdom of Satan. Once you have believed in Jesus for his promise of eternal life, you not only get eternal life, but you moved. You, mo you didn't know that you moved, but you moved. You were transferred, legally transferred, positionally transferred to the kingdom of the son of his love or his beloved son. Isn't that amazing? You're in a different kingdom now. That's why Satan doesn't like you because you are his enemy in his territory. That's why we're in spiritual warfare. All right, now, 
Back to Daniel. Various aspects. There's multiple aspects of the kingdom, but just to help clarify, and you'll see this chart again another time or two or three. The earthly kingdom is the millennial kingdom. Every saved person from all of the ages will be there. That's part of the promise of our God. Jewish people who are rewarded will be able to live in the ancestral kingdom. We see that over in Ezekiel, the ancestral kingdom. Not all the Jews are, are going to live in the ancestral kingdom, even though they'll live in the earthly kingdom. They will have, they will have to live out among Gentiles. Now, those in the ancestral kingdom, many of those will be in their physical bodies. Many of those will also be rewarded in the heavenly kingdom. And that NJ up there means New Jerusalem, not New Jersey. I promise you, New Jersey is not heaven on earth. Neither is the pencil state. Pennsylvania, yes, I know. Here's the thing. You can be in the broader kingdom while excluded from the more narrow aspects of the kingdom. Every believer will be in the earthly kingdom. Some of those believers in their physical bodies who are Jewish will live in the ancestral kingdom. In the earthly kingdom will be both people in physical bodies and in, and in resurrected bodies, not glorified, resurrected bodies, incorruptible, so forth and so forth. The rewarded portion of the kingdom, the new Jerusalem, is where all the glorified people will live for all eternity. Of those Jewish people, I believe you can argue because he said David will be king over you. He's going to be glorified. His home base is in the new Jerusalem. But where is he going to do much of his work? In the earthly Jerusalem over the kingdom, along with the apostles whom the Lord said, you're going to sit on 12 thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. They also are glorified believers. Those are their home bases there. They just have to travel to work. And I, I don't know how that travel is going to be. But I don't think you're going to have any problem with commuting. But can I get, okay, let me speculate here real quick. Can I have some fun? Do like this. Remember, remember Jacob when he fell asleep with his head on a rock? We actually read about something Jesus said to, uh, 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 oh, name just went out of my head. Isn't that awful? Anyhow. But he said, you're going to, that he saw what? Angels going up and down a ladder. Now, the word angel simply means messenger. Is that possible that that's the escalator between the new Jerusalem and the earth? It might be. I don't know. But that's a fascinating thing to think about. But anyway. All right, so certainly those outside the land, notice what it says, will be raised to shame or to shame, disgrace, shame, and contempt. Those outside the land, it will be to their shame and to their contempt or abhorrence, is how so how can be translated. The same principle of the negative evaluation in the New Testament we see here in the Old Testament. Our God is consistent. It could be. It could be, it could be, since he uses two different words there, that those in the stronger word of abhorrence will be those in the outer darkness portion of the kingdom. Which if I understand all of this correct, there will be those who will not be glorified but they will not be in the outer darkness. And I have come to the conclusion the same is going to be for the church age. We'll be teaching on that. The same holds true with the resurrected. So there will be a division between overcomers and the overcome. But if we go back and we see Daniel 12 2, certain people are raised, uh, you know, to abhorrence and contempt. And if you go to Ezekiel 20, 38, it talks about the rebels and those who have transgressed. That word rebel is marad. It means to resist authority, whereas transgression is pasha, and it means the sin of breaking away from God's authority. 
It seems that while all, remember the Jewish people, he said, all of you, I forgot your, you know, I'm going to give you the grace. I'm going to give you all of these things. If we saw it in, in Ezekiel 34, remember? You with me? Nod your head up and down. Okay, stay with me now. Listen, I'm having a blast up here, so encourage me a little bit. Am, are, am I explaining it okay? Are, we, are you with me? How many of you aren't with me? You're afraid to admit it, aren't you? Anyway. You see, grammatically, it's where I think we pay attention to grammar. A lot of times it helps us. Okay? You see, <laughs> doctrine matters sometimes. I, I knew what he thought. I knew what he thought when I made that mistake years ago. I'm reminded of it by my own son-in-law. But anyhow, the rescued believers, since that's in the active tense in Ezekiel 20, and it's talking about those who are rescued, they're alive in their physical bodies, but in the active tense, they did not repent before the second coming or they were last minute repenters. And as a result, they, they did not have any time to be able to be considered for the positive reward of that positive experience of eternal life or glorification. Personally, I believe the Jewish leaders are going to be in that group because remember, this is where doctrine supports doctrine. Remember, the Jewish leaders at the time of the second coming have to reverse what the Jewish leaders did at the time of the first coming. When they called them, they, they, they called the people crucify and crucify and crucify. The, the leadership of the Jewish people have to reverse that. And instead of calling crucify him, they not only have believed in him, but they call on him to return as the Messiah. But it's at the very last minute. Speculation, yes. Opinion, yes. But I believe a lot of those Jewish believers are part of the rebels. And they will be outside the land. In Ezekiel 38, it says they're going to be purged. The word there is vera. And it means to separate in order to purify or to eliminate something like a mixture of, of uh, different metals. Uh, it means to be chosen out of the highest quality. That's the Discovery Bible. It means to select or separate. It never means to be killed. So those rebels are not killed. They're just separated out. The resurrected believers who die in a state of rebellion, and I believe this, you can say in a very similar way for the church age believers, that or maybe last minute in their repentance, are not allowed to live in the promised land. And they, and they may have to live in the outer darkness. This is why it says, look at this real quick. Here's Ezekiel 20, 39. Stay with me about five more minutes. Can we do that? All right. As for you, O house of Israel, thus says the Lord God, go serve every one of you his idols. And hereafter, if you will not obey me, well, who are those? The rebels and the transgressors. You say, wait a minute. These are believers. Mm -hmm. Does Israel not have a history, a long history of believers moving into idolatry? Yes. Did the church at Corinth, who were believers, were they practicing idolatry and sexual perversion in the temples? The answer is yes. Even in Revelation, it talks about the church at Thyatira, where they are involved with stuff dealing with temple worship of idols. So he says, but profane my holy name no more. This is a command for repentance. Don't profane my name anymore with your gifts and your idols. Idols, some of the, are these secret believers? Are they carnal believers in the tribulation period? Because believers can too, can be deceived. We know that. And involved in idolatrous worship. During the tribulation period, it says in Revelation that there, so many people are going to be involved in worshiping demons. Now, how many people are going to be spiritually strong enough, even as believers, but what they may take the easier way out to help sustain their life by simply worshiping in front of a demon or a demonic idol. You still with me? And don't think believers today don't worship idols. We do. Sometimes what is it? Anything that takes us away from the Lord is our idol. So the next time you're tempted into a sin, remember you're about to worship an idol. And behind every idol, is a demon. 
All believers from all time are going to be in the Messianic kingdom, one place or the other. Some of the Jewish believers will not live in the land promised to Abraham. So if I understand this correctly, these are the ones who are more than just spiritual failures. We have seen, those were the ones that the Lord said, I'm going to give you grace. But rather, these are the ones that Ezekiel 34 may call the fat sheep, the strong sheep, those who did not repent or maybe repented at the last possible second. And it's too late for them to change what's going to happen in the evaluation. And there's the chart of it. Marty Colley did most of that. What do you have? The Jewish Bema. All the living Jewish believers will be rescued. Many, but not all of the dead will be raised. The reason it's not all is because it's only believers who are going to be raised. Only Old Testament believers are raised before the millennial kingdom. Of those raised, some of these Old Testament believers will be raised to eternal life. Daniel 12, 2. Some of those believers, those who are raised to eternal life, will shine brightly like stars for eternity. A subgroup of the eternal life group. Some of those believers will be raised to eternal shame. And I believe based upon what the Lord says in Matthew 8, that some of those believers will be in the eternal outer darkness. Here's what he says. Jesus says in Matthew 8, and I say to you that many will come from the east and the west and will sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. Where's the kingdom of heaven? The new Jerusalem. But the sons of the kingdom Born again men, Jewish people, men and women, Jewish people will be cast into the outer darkness, not just out of the land in the outer darkness. And there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Born again Jews in a position to inherit the kingdom, to qual but to quali but they fail to qualify to inherit. The same thing is for us. And as much as I don't want to, I have to stop. They're excluded from the ancestral kingdom and the reward kingdom. Many of those are going to be in the outer darkness. Beloved, we have the same thing. Positionally, I can show you this from Ephesians, but positionally, we are already seated with the Lord in the heavens. It's our position to be there as a ruler. It's our position in the eyes of God the Father. Because of what the Lord Jesus Christ did, and you believed in him for eternal life. Positionally, you're already there. However, Jesus also says in Revelation 3, that for those who overcome will sit with me on my throne. We can lose that opportunity. We will lose what is positionally ours, will never become practically ours. We will fail to inherit the kingdom, just like a lot of these Jewish people we're looking at here will fail to inherit what is theirs by right because they're Jewish descendants and because they're believers, but yet they can't have it. And they're going to know shame and disgrace. That same thing is us. We too have everything we need by right to succeed. Positionally, it's yours. Positionally, I would argue, from Ephesians 1, you've already been blessed with every spiritual blessing. And that is that your rewards and assignments in the coming kingdom are already assigned to you positionally. But if you fail to qualify, as Jesus said in one of the parables, it'll be taken from you and given to somebody else. Talk about shame and disgrace. You wonder why there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. That's getting so mad at yourself, you can't even see straight. You ever get mad at yourself because you really, really, really did something stupid? This is going to be a sorrow and an anger at yourself like you've never experienced before. Because you see, Jesus not only positionally placed you there, guaranteed your eternal life. He gave you this book, the Word of God, to teach you. He gave you the Holy Spirit to help you understand it and to stay in fellowship with him to control your sin nature. He placed you into the church where you can be taught the word of God. To fail to succeed is a choice. Don't ever say, when you're tempted and you sin, hear me, don't ever say, it was just a mistake. Now what? It was a choice to sin. Can we recover? You bet. 
But don't let it go on because you're going to miss everything God has for you. And for all of you here online, I hope that you're listening and all those who are going to be listening on YouTube and Rumble, uh, pay attention. Pay close attention. And go to the Word of God and be a Berean and check it out for yourself. That's why I always want you to look at the Bible. Don't just take my word for it. Let's close in prayer. Father in heaven, thank you for this time. Thank you for the attention of all of those who are here. I pray, Father, that by your spirit, you will drive these truths home to our hearts so that we will be positive in responding in discipleship. We will respond uh, in such a way that we will come to you, Lord Jesus, and say, Rabbi, teacher, teach us. And you take your word and your spirit and you teach us, you train us, you prepare us. We are transformed by the renewing of our minds so that we can be different people than what we are now. We can be the kind that you will say, well done, good and faithful servant. This we pray. Would you keep your heads bowed and eyes closed for a minute? At both the first class and the second class today, we've kind of hit on this theme. Like I said, when I started, there's no greater desire I have in my heart than for all of us to stand before the Lord approved myself included. If the Lord has spoken to you today in your heart about something you know you need to change, you need to deal with, or a decision you need to make, in some way he's spoken to you and you're responding positively to his word today, would you signify that by just raising your hand and putting it? Glory to God. Hands all over. Praise God. Praise God. Run with endurance the race that is set before you below. Father in heaven, thank you for this time around your word. Drive these truths home to us. And may they be a living reality in our lives. And may all of us become everything you want us to be. So we can be stable in time and rewarded in eternity. Oh, what a day that will be when my Jesus I will see when I am ready for it. Praise God. We thank you, Jesus, for these promises. Thank you for your word. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Would you stand? And that's pretty funny. I've had my glasses all this time. What page number? I can't see it. 423. 423. Hang on. Uh, let me get my glasses. I cannot see what I'm doing. I better turn this record on.